Welcome everyone to the channel. This video is specially prepared for people who constantly write that there haven't been any complex projects on the channel lately. If you are a beginner radio enthusiast, just watch this video and don't try to replicate what you see, as implementing it requires quite a serious experience with switching power supplies. Yes, today, we will be talking about a switching power supply. But before we start, I should note that this power supply was featured on the Radio Code website. In the description, I will leave a link to the forum thread where the schematic was discussed, as well as programs for calculating transformers and inductors that are present in this power supply. My version slightly differs from the original schematic in terms of the chip circuitry, the presence of output voltage stabilization, and the type of output rectifier. In the description below this video, you will find an archive. I highly recommend studying it if you want to assemble this power supply. Links to purchase some components can also be found in the description. And one more thing. Some units or component values in the schematic may differ from those on the board. This is quite acceptable and does not affect the overall operation of the circuit. Finally, the most important thing. This power supply was made quite a while ago and there were issues with sourcing components. There was no point in filming a video for the installation of each new component. It made no sense. I mostly took photos, on which I will explain some points. I hope this is not critical for you. This is a network-stabilized half-bridge switching power supply with current-triggered protection. The schematic looks solid. By the way, I spent more than 4 hours drawing it. The calculated power of my version is about 800 watts, but it can be more. With this arrangement of components, the circuit will deliver a kilowatt without any issues. My version is designed for a unipolar output. Voltage, but nothing prevents it from being made for a bipolar output. The heart and soul of this power supply is the advanced push-pull PWM controller SG3525. In the past, hobbyists used to assemble switching power supplies for specific needs themselves. Believe me, it's quite a challenging task. Without certain skills, you'll just end up burning a bunch of transistors, which are quite expensive. Nowadays, the Chinese dominate this field as well, offering ready-made power supplies for a wide range of purposes. Prices depend on the power output. For example, a similar unit on AliExpress costs from $80. It's not cheap, but if you need a power supply and can't build one yourself, you can simply buy it. I'll leave links to such power supplies in the description. The microchip with its components is installed on a separate printed circuit board. In the description, you'll find the board from the author. My version, as I mentioned earlier, was modified. I didn't etch a separate board. I made all the additions on the track side using surface mounting. However, some tracks on the original board had to be cut. The power switches are controlled using a matching transformer, which simultaneously provides complete galvanic isolation of the low-voltage control circuit. From the hot part, the control circuit is powered by a separate iron transformer at 50 Hz. The specified transformer should provide a voltage of 12 to 20 V on the secondary winding with a current of 50 mA. The power supply for the control circuit is stabilized by a linear regulator at 12 volts and filtered with a pair of electrolytic capacitors. Diodes, just kidding. At the output. The microcircuits protect it from the self-induction of the control transformer. Note that the grounds are different, meaning the power supply. Ground is separated from the control system ground and the output ground, which is provided by using a matching transformer. First, galvanic isolation. In case of power switch failure, high voltage will not reach the control system and cause additional headaches. Secondly, such a transformer provides sufficient current for effective control of switches with rather heavy gates, eliminating the need to create a complex setup for gate discharge. This is not necessary for the switches. Such a solution is used even in serious industrial power supplies. Here is a power supply from very expensive medical equipment, which uses exactly the same solution. At the input of the power supply, there is a network filter. Next, the power goes to the rectifier. The now direct current is smoothed by high voltage electrolytic capacitors and goes to the field effect switches. Even though the matching transformer can handle controlling even fairly heavy field effect switches, 
this aspect should not be overused. And if possible, try to select transistors with the lowest possible gate capacitance. Here is a small table with the parameters of popular high-voltage field effect transistors. In my version, I initially used our 6025 switches. They are rated for 600 volts with a current of 25 amperes. Then I found the more preferable RFP450. I ended up using them. If you plan to draw power from the power supply within 700 watts, then popular and inexpensive field effect transistors will work great. The RFP450 series. In theory, they are capable of more, but in this case, you need to ensure very good cooling. The matching transformer is wound on a ferrite core. The dimensions are now in front of you. Such a core can be found in computer power supplies. In some sources, such cores are used as the core of the output choke. For winding, I used MGTF wire with a diameter of mm. All three windings are wound with this wire. The transformer needs to be calculated. Its parameters depend on the core used, the operating frequency of the generator, and so on. Here is an example of the calculation for my transformer. The secondary windings are identical and contain 12 turns each, the primary has 17. I wound all three windings at once. After 12 turns, I cut the leads of the secondary windings and continued winding the primary since it consists of 17 turns. There should be no problems with connecting the windings. The author laid out the board, quite cleverly, but just in case, the beginnings of all windings are indicated in the diagram. Next comes the current transformer. This transformer is wound on the same core as the matching transformer. The current transformer has a primary winding in the form of a single turn. Essentially, it's one of the power wires going to the transformer that passes through the ring. The secondary winding consists of two identical halves connected with a center tap. That is, the beginning of one winding is connected to the end, other. Each half consists of 50 turns. The wire with lacquer insulation has a diameter of mm. Again, for maximum identicality, both windings are wound simultaneously. The secondary winding is complemented by a full wave rectifier with a center tap and a load resistor. The principle of operation of the protection is quite simple. A variable resistor sets the protection activation threshold. An increase in current in the secondary circuit, for example, during a short circuit, instantly leads to an increase in current in the primary winding of the transformer and Consequently, the current will also increase in the section of wire that is stretched around the current transformer wing. This, in turn, leads to an increase in voltage on the secondary winding of the current transformer, and consequently, the voltage drop increases. On the current resistor, from which the readings are essentially taken. If this voltage is above the set threshold, a trigger latch is activated. The microchip stops generating, and the circuit goes into protection mode. Capacitors C16 and C17 are the capacitances of the half bridge. Essentially, the operation of the circuit is based on the discharge of these capacitors' capacitances to the primary winding of the transformer, and the field effect switches, by switching, provide the charging and subsequent discharging of these capacitors. Next in line is the power pulse transformer which is designed using the excellent program. And in front of you now is a screenshot of my core calculation. The core is U-shaped, although it can also be ring-shaped. There should be no gap between the halves. After calculating the transformer, we wind half of the primary winding onto the bare frame, then the entire secondary winding, and on top of that, the remaining half of the primary. Each layer is insulated. I use thermal tape as insulation. The type of output rectifier is a full wave with the sender tap. This rectifier is convenient because it saves diodes and compared to a bridge rectifier, you can use a thinner wire for the winding to achieve the same output current. I used a powerful dual type diode STTH6003 as the output rectifier. This is a fast acting diode assembly rated at 300 volts and 30 amps. Output choke. 
It is also calculated using a specialized program, the link to which I will leave in the description. There's not much to say here. Yellow white ring, core material, powdered iron. It was taken from the output filter of a powerful computer power supply. The output voltage, as mentioned earlier, is stabilized and set by Zener diodes. This is not the best option, as Zener diode setups are not super accurate, and the output voltage can deviate from the set value by a couple of volts. There are better options, for example, the TL431 reference voltage source. But our option is distinguished by its simplicity and works quite well. Resistors, R7, and R22, are intended for discharging the capacitors after the power source is disconnected from the network. I recommend using 1 watt or 2 watt resistors. The output, electrolytic capacitors should have a rated voltage at least a couple of dozen volts, higher than the actual output voltage. The half bridge capacitors should preferably be rated for 400 volts, or at the very least 250 volts. A couple of tips at the end. If you plan to use this power supply to power, say, power amplifiers, it's better to exclude the voltage stabilization function, as the specified voltage is maintained by the PWM chip. And the HM signal, in turn, introduces additional power supply noise. The schematic differs from the printed circuit board and the archive only by the generator's surrounding components. But I attached an additional document to the archive, where I showed in detail what to connect where. Alternatively, you can assemble the author's version without voltage stabilization and with bipolar output voltage. Friends, in the end, I want to confess, video, complex and hard to digest projects are not filmed because they are more costly in terms of both time and finances. In addition, as a rule, such videos do not gain many views and are only interesting to a narrow circle of radio enthusiasts. If I'm wrong, let me know by liking this video. Likes don't bring money, but they help authors understand the audience's mood. I remind you that in the description you can find an archive with schematics, boards, and other documentation. In the description, you will also find links to purchase some components for assembling this power source, as well as links to ready-made industrial power supplies of different power and price categories. And all that's left for me is to say goodbye. Well, as always, it was your forever Kazianaka with you. Wishing you happiness, friends, and see you on October 10th. Bye.